Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you, um, Kendra. That was a memorable time um, with an eagle that was not really happy about being in front of the state house. I mean, why wouldn't you be happy to be paraded out in front of the state house? But it was for a great cause, and to hear that the Baldy license plates have raised that amount of money for wetland conservation is really a great story. So I salute you, and I, we were pleased to do it. You know, um, it's a pleasure to be back with you folks. Um, I don't make appearances very often. I am a dinosaur. I'm an old fart. They put me out to pasture three years ago, kind of enjoying retirement, um, but uh, still have fondness for this organization. And I was reflecting on, I think, the first OWMA meeting I went to was 1978, I still have the program guide. Now your keynote was a little bit higher quality. It was Dr. L. David Meck talking about wolves in Minnesota. That was a good one. But think about 1978. It would be the next year that bald eagle numbers would bottom out with only four active pair in the state of Ohio. Um, think about in the 1978, white-tailed deer were numbered in the tens of thousands in Ohio and not the populations that we see today. Uh, it was about that it was only eight or nine years after the Cuyahoga River had burned and Lake Erie had been proclaimed dead. Um, it's, it's, we've come a long way. An extraordinary amount of positive things have happened in, in the intervening years, uh, both with intent and also with things that are conducive to wildlife recovery. But it, it just, it uh, bears sort of repeating about where we've been and how far we've come because sometimes we can get a little disillusioned with the challenges that face us today um, and so that there's always hope. Um, you know, I remember I had a wonderful opportunity as a kid, a unique opportunity. I was asked if I wanted to participate in a camp now we all go to camp, but you know, I usually go to camp, and it's a 4-H camp, or it's a camp here or there. This camp was at the Linus Point Shooting Club. This was a camp. So we were, I think, sixth graders, and there was a group of us, and this was a, a, a plot that was hatched out by Bill Brown, who was a member of the club, and uh, Bill Sheely, who was the director of the Natural History Museum. So most of us kids had some affiliation with a member of the Wines Point Shooting Club, but we got the chance to spend two weeks in that paradise learning all about the marsh in the summertime. We trapped muskrats, we skinned them, we, we trapped snapping turtles and ate them. We were required to do wildlife studies. I studied the yellow warblers on the entry drive in the willows. Um, there were still nesting bald eagles on the property, and it was like a magic, magic time. And it was really inform, uh, informative to me in my career because that's where I first encountered a bald eagle. I'm very pleased that uh, I was asked last year to join the board of the Linus Point Marsh Conservancy and talk about an evolution. That organization, the oldest continuous uh, shooting club in North America, has gone from just a shooting club to be a major, major force for wetland <coughs> conservation, sort of leading the way in, in endangered species, uh, in invasive species control. And it's just amazing to see. I, I was there after the, um, the, the morning of the board meeting and I went out walking on the dikes, I guess it was probably 5.30 in the morning, this is last May. And it was incredible because I gave up counting bald eagles at about 50. Um, there were white pelicans on Muddy Creek Bay. You could hear at least four pair of sandhill cranes that were bugling in various spots, just teeming with life. And you got that sense of this is what Muddy Creek Bay and Sandusky Bay and the Western Marshes were like, maybe in the early 1600s. You get a sense of just the potential of the hummingbird sea that is Lake Erie, this incredibly biologically productive space. So wonderful opportunity and it sort of set me on the course ultimately that I would take. So um, when I was asked uh, by Christina to do a program, you know, I've addressed you guys a couple times before. I don't have a whole lot of new stories. So I came up with this as just an opportunity to spin a yarn or two and maybe get some perspective on the things that I was involved with up at the Museum of Natural History. Some things are very involved with the Ohio Division of Wildlife and uh, some reflections for the long haul. So let's just get right into it. 
I do come from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, at least that's where I worked. I do have uh, the title of Ambassador Emeritus. I thought I was going to get a sash and a fancy hat <laughs> and some other accoutrement, but that didn't quite happen. Anyway, the Museum of Natural History just celebrated um, its 100th anniversary, and it also dates its, its DNA back to a group of pioneer naturalists like uh, Jared Potter Kirtland that used to get together um, on Public Square, a little one-room, two-room, one-story cabin owned by the Case family, and they called themselves the Archites. because this place filled with all of the things they collected and stuff was in fact called the Ark. And uh, Kirtland was part of that. Many of the people who had become pioneering naturalists of this, of the northern part of the state of Ohio were all members. And uh, from that uh, evolved the Cleveland Academy of Natural Science, then the Kirtland Society of Natural Sciences, and ultimately that evolved to be the Museum of Natural History. And if you've not been to the Museum of Natural History, it's undergoing quite a renaissance. There's a major capital, um, expansion going on. This is a, gives you a, a look-see. This is a new um, uh, addition. This is an existing planetarium, a brand new entrance and lobby. Um, this is a $150 million makeover. And um, by the time all the exhibit galleries open up next December, it'll be a brand new place. So uh, you know, get on up there. And I think we've got some, some passes that might be up for grabs later on. Um, and it's, it's very cool, and by the way, the, the architecture here is meant to be evocative of water. Water in its liquid state or water oozing across the landscape in the form of a glacier. The forces that shape, obviously, the, the contours of the state of Ohio. And most of my job there, over 46 and a half years, generally I had an animal on one arm or the other. Um, we had a group of animal ambassadors um, as part of a place called the Ralph Perkins II Wildlife Center in Woods Garden. And uh, there we um, displayed native Ohio wildlife in a naturalistic setting. And we weren't in business of being competition for the Cleveland Zoo. Our goal was just to focus on that which is from here. So that people who would come to the museum and engage these places would get some sense about the rich wildlife resources of the state of Ohio and the living systems they depend upon, but also get kind of fired up about why they should care about them. And we did a major remodel of this in 2016. If you've not been there, it's kind of cool. Um, it's multi-level on a two acre spot to the south of the museum. Um, it's got a large walk through aviary. It's got this elevated walkway and we've got all sorts of cool animals, including this is Bad Bob, one of our bobcats. Bad Bob came from Tucson, Arizona, where he was a rehab animal, uh, found as a kit and too uh, tame to be returned to the wild. He and his cage mate, Biddy, came to the museum um, 22 years ago, and I'm happy to say that they're still doing fine and they're still on display. So not only could you see up close um, and, and have sort of this in intimate encounters with bobcats at the Perkins Wildlife Center. And this one looks like it got milk. Um, and of course, if you're a cat, your favorite thing is a box. But one of the things that we were able to come up with, a unique innovation, was a system of aerial trailways that connected lots of the enclosures. And the opportunity here was to give the animals a totally new enrichment thing. Like, you don't have to get stuck in your cage for the rest of your life. You can go on a road trip to another enclosure, and you can be above the visitors, so instead of being the observed, you become the observer. And for the visitor, you get a chance to feel like what it's like to be prey. <laughs> um, and so it's a really cool, successful thing. I'd love to take claim for this idea and this innovation, but the Philadelphia Zoo came up with it about 10 years ago, and it's just a brilliant way of doing it. And not only do you have opportunities for the animals then to be above the visitors, but you also create things which we call parallel play opportunities. So now we have kids that can go through the trailways that are very similar to what the bobcats or the foxes or the coyotes or any of the other mammals that have access to these trailways are using. And it creates this amazing, robust, immersive experience. And we're really proud of that and the effect it has on visitors. It's just a it, it fine, we think it, it finally gives Ohio wildlife the, the
the presentation, the treatment they deserve. <coughs> like this enclosure with the gray fox, visitors can be on either side of it. The mesh itself seems to be very transparent, and so you feel like you're in the same space with that gray fox. And of course, the gray fox has these ramps that it can exercise its neat climbing abilities and access the trailways too. And by the way, they can't be in the trailways at the same time as the bobcats. Um, our red fox, the same way, our albino raccoon, Nico. And then there's a, an elevated walkway for um, our visitors that goes above about an 1,800 square foot enclosure for coyotes. And this is a really dynamic thing because coyotes, you know, get a bad rap. Um, and they're misunderstood and a lot of fear about them. But they're here in the state of Ohio, they're here to stay, they're firmly ensconced in all 88 counties. And so it's important to know what they are. And of course, if you, if you know, if you like a dog, and once you have an opportunity to see coyotes in a captive setting, in a more intimate setting, all of the things that you admire about a dog, of course, their, their um, sister member of the genus, they're exhibiting those same kinds of behaviors here, and it's really cool. Um, now we had to get the right kind of coyotes for this. You just couldn't put any rehab animals in here. So the way we got them is we heard about coyotes at a rehab center outside of Dallas, Texas. And apparently the story was a guy was driving along the highway, the Ark, Texas highway one night, coyote runs out in front of him, he hits the coyote. Boom, he pulls off to the side of the road because guess what? He is a wildlife biologist and he wants to see what happened? So he gets out, he takes a look at the coyote, coyote is dead, hit in the head, killed instantly. But as he examines the body, he sees that she has a swollen belt. So being a wildlife biologist, he reaches down, expresses colostrum from one of her teats, realizes that she's very close to giving birth, pulls out his knife, slices her open, and delivers four healthy pups on the side of the Texas highway sort of an interesting C-section delivery of coyotes. They ended up being hand-raised at this rehab center, and they tried to mainstream them with other orphan coyotes that were bound for release, but they just stayed too ridiculously tame, and they knew that this was not gonna be an option. So we got three of them, and they're just really delightful animals. <laughs> this is a great enrichment thing. This is the cheapest enrichment of all. You take a blanket, you leave it in with the river otters overnight, then you take it the next morning and give it to the coyotes, and for the next 45 minutes, eh, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what about, I don't know what the caption for that should be. But anyway, it's great. You know, if you get up there, um, we do have four coyotes on display there, one from Michigan and, and three from, from uh, Texas, and just a really cool opportunity for folks to see them. I mentioned the otters. We have otters that have come to us from uh, trapped out of the bayous of Louisiana. Um, some, a, a source that originally, I believe, some of the otters that we used for re reintroduction into the state of Ohio came from these same locations. So basically places where you have catfish farms or crawdad farms, and otters and raccoons are the enemy. And the rat, they trap them out. There's a couple licensed trappers who then maintain them in the living state, and then uh, keep them in quarantine. And it's been a primary avenue by which North American zoos have been able to get river otters, because delightful as they are, and as well as they do in captivity, they don't breed oftentimes that well in captivity. So the museum has a trio of them, and these just are delightful animals. And it's amazing how an animal that was wild one month within maybe six weeks you can actually have eating out of your hand. They're so amenable to training um, and uh, positive reinforcement. And we have opportunities where you can sort of stick your head into a concavity in this big plexi uh, wall and sort of get the sense that you're in the wetland, as well as this big bulge that comes out where it seems like the otters are coming to you. It's a really cool opportunity to go nose to nose with a delightful mustelis. I don't know what the caption should this be, but uh, for enrichment, our porcupine, Sir Lancelot, uh, loves to sit as long as he gets a you know corn on the cob in a little uh, a little uh, go-to vehicle. So um, we try and do lots of enrichment. I think that my successor Jim Nemeth is trying to use much more natural enrichment than uh, this little lavender car. 
We also have a, a bunch of ambassador animals, um, bald eagles on display, bald eagle that we use in educational programs, and I wish we had that bald eagle back in 1998. It would have been a lot easier in front of the state house. But the whole idea of having these things, ravens and crows, is just to give people an opportunity to get to know Ohio wildlife and get beyond what you, you know, the wives' tales or the storylines or the, the uh, anecdotes um, and learn something positive about the things that share this part of the world with us. And we think it's really important. And you know, the first step to, to the wild is to step out your back door. And no matter where you live, there is nature around you. So giving people the tools to be able to encounter that. So we like to think of the Perkins Wildlife Center as a trailhead, as an advanced organizer. It gives you some of the tools so that when you go exploring your world, you can look for the footprints, you can look for the signs. Um, of some of these animals that share this part of the world with you. And it, that engendering awe and wonder is sort of what a museum is all about. And Kendra talked about the importance of engagement and you know the, the power of what every, the, the things that the Ohio Division of Wildlife does and the wildlife biologists do and the resources, whether you're a hunter or fisher person, whether you happen to be a, uh, uh, a bird watcher, it's that these are incredibly important resources and we need to engage new audiences with them so they'll care about them, they will support the agencies that are responsible for their management and conservation. So um, I love these pictures, you know, nothing like a little spider there getting a, the awe of a young child. Now I'm often asked, well, what the heck is natural history then? You know, is it the history of nature, which is sort of the default? I just throw this up here because when I define it, I define it as the close observation and examination of the natural world. Identifying its parts, exploring its relationships, elucidating its nature. It's the science of origins and connections. It's the science of change over time. It's the quest to understand ourselves, the universe in which we live, and our place in it. To study natural history is to embark on a journey that can take you to the farthest reaches of the cosmos which starts at your own back door. And I think that every two-year-old is a natural historian. What's that? Once you know what it is, what's it connected to? And if I tug on it, what happens? We're all about knowing the world around us. And in, in nurturing that curiosity is a really important thing. And that was a big part of my job, using live animals to do that, and trying to recruit and build some of the scientists for the future. But when you're at a museum of natural history, by definition, you come face to face with extinction because it's in the exhibit galleries all around you. And, you know, when I was growing up, extinction seemed to be, you know, dinosaurs, they're cool, they lived a long time ago, they became extinct in the story. Um, but it turns out that there's a lot to be learned from the past. I had to show you this though, because in my last year at the museum, one of the wonderful things we did is we worked with uh, Center President Larry Ophoff and uh, Governor DeWine, and we uh, helped nurture along Senate Bill 123 that proclaimed Dunkleosteus Torelli, um, Dunk as we like to call him, catch it, the official state fossil fish in the state of Ohio. So this is now part of one of the icons of our state. And it's this giant extinct armored fish. You're not gonna find this in the waterways of Ohio now, but it was in the ancient seas that covered Ohio 360 million years ago. And these placoderms were just amazing. Armored head, but cartilaginous spine. So I usually find are their head shields. Sclerotic rings, armor around their eyes. I mean, how cool is that? and no teeth. Instead, you have jaws that are modified to be meat cleavers with self-sharpening edges so they could slice the sharks and the sea scorpions that they shared those shallow seas with when Ohio was 800 miles south of the equator, which is a pretty cool thing. You know, we were tropical Ohio back then, but we were all wet. Anyway, it's a very cool fish, and it comes from the Ohio shales, particularly the Cleveland member of the Ohio. But we also have our share of dinosaurs at the museum. And you know, people used to ask, well, what's the relevance of dinosaurs? Who gives a care about dinosaurs? Yeah, they dominated the planet for a while, back in the, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, but then they became extinct. They're losers. 
You know, they couldn't cope with an asteroid. Come on. But you know, one of the things that's been revelatory in the years that I've been at the museum has been this change in our understanding of what dinosaurs are, or more importantly, who birds are. Because now we know that birds are in fact dinosaurs. That not all the dinosaurs died off when that asteroid slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula back 65 million years ago. Birds survived. And how do we know this? Well, the two-legged dinosaurs and birds are this huge group of bipedal organisms, and they're not bipedal by convergence, they're bipedal by common origin. And you can find on a lot of things, even T-Rex, you can find feathers. So if there's the presence of feathers and you basically have the skeletal apparatus that's akin to dinosaurs, what's different? You might say, well, birds fly. Well, I'm sorry, but not all birds do fly. And uh, so it turns out that, you know, birds are just dinosaurs that survive to this day, which is cool. <laughs> Why? Because that means when you go to KFC, you get Kentucky Fried Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Now, uh, besides dinosaurs, the thing that I always would want every day, probably four times a day as I go from my office out to the Perkins Wildlife Center or get hauled up into the president's office, whatever, um, I would see this brace of passenger pigeons on display. And when you took a look at these animals that were stuffed probably 150 years ago, they looked perfect. They looked like they could have breathed their last the day before the iridescent sheen on this male. <clears throat> just fascinating animals, and I just got kind of really caught up in what the heck happened? What a magnificent bird. Superficial resemblance to a morning dove, but it's the size of a rock pigeon. Okay, this is not a little bird. A bird that is fully capable of swallowing beech nuts and white, acorn, white oak acorns, possibly even chestnuts. Um, and it was a bird that, that thrived on the mast, the hard fruits of the forests that covered Eastern North America. It was endemic to Eastern North America, and estimates of their numbers go anywhere from three to seven billion strong. We think it might, might have been the most numerous bird on planet Earth when it was first being described as science in the early 1800s. Billions. Audubon talked about one flock near Henderson, Kentucky. He estimated 1.1 billion birds in a flock that darkened the sky like an eclipse with the dung falling like snowflakes in the forest. There's an image. <laughs> um, but they're all extinct. What happened? Well, they were endemic again to these great forests that covered Ohio, and Ohio basically was almost entirely forested back then. Yes, we had prairies, we had um, open areas, but this uh, depiction of where the virgin forest in the early 1600s was, basically you've got most of eastern North America is blanketed in forest. And passenger pigeons, um, though their range could go out into the, the, the Great Plains, basically their core breeding range was the Great Lakes. So it was Indiana, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, maybe down in Kentucky and West Virginia, including all New England states, Wisconsin, and then uh, parts of Quebec and parts of Ontario. And they would winter further south by the billions. They would return to areas that had mast that was left over from the fall before, preserved by snow cover. They'd show up in February. So if you were looking for passenger pigeons, they'd be showing up in three weeks. And they would show up looking for those areas, and then they would descend, and they would form these rookeries. One of their nesting areas was um, in southern Wisconsin, and it covered 850 square miles of just nothing but passenger pigeon's nests in every tree. Their numbers sometimes broke the branches they were on. Unbelievable productivity, and a, a highly synchronized nesting. Um, uh, symphony, basically all the males, females getting together, pairing off, creating nests, laying eggs, incubating eggs, hatching squabs, raising squabs, getting squabs out of the nest, all happening within about a month to five weeks and all highly synchronized because it turns out that trees have a masting strategy to keep the nut or the mast predators at bay, keep them off their guard. You don't see the same amount of beech nuts under a beech tree every year. You'll have a years of plenty and years of uh, uh, famine. 
And that is a, in part a, a strategy to be able to outwit the squirrels and the turkey and all the other things that might be there that would try and take advantage of that. So these guys employed that same predator satiation model. So it's kind of cool, just this neat thing um, that evolved in a major way following the last glaciation. And so this incredibly dominant feature of the Ohio landscape. So what happens? Well, it doesn't take too long before the early, 15, the early 1800s up to 1850 that you can see that the main area of settlement and deforestation is basically the core of the range, breeding range of the passenger pigeon. And you have you know, the accelerating of logging and clearing of the forests, both to be able to fuel what will be the Industrial Revolution, but also just clearing the land for agriculture, the establishment of railroads to facilitate that and to open up frontiers and wilderness. The original social media, once you have telegraph, if you do have a nesting of millions of birds, the word got out to who? The market hunters. And they would go and they would blast away at these populations of, of passenger pigeons. And by the millions, they put them in barrels, put them on a train, and then, um, and this is, we don't have any pictures, by the way, of this, even though photography existed. I don't know how you would take one of those big box cameras out there and try and capture a billion passenger pigeons going overhead. But we do have some lithographs that just show, you see some gunners here, and you see this river of birds coming from the north heading to the south. Um, but once you harvested them, again, you packed them up, you got them on a train, they get to the places like the Fulton uh, Game Market in New York City, and then two days later they would be served up as uh, Valentines of Squab a la Madison at Del Monte's in New York. They were great eating, they were cheap protein, they're widely available. Uh, the first Americans and Native Americans totally depended upon them when they existed in their area because they wouldn't be nesting every year. And when it came time to thinking about conserving them, we didn't have any model for it. I mean, if, if you thought, well, okay, a, if a bird is a migratory bird, it comes back to a wetland, if I preserve the wetland, a place they can nest, well, bingo, that I've got a chance that we can you know, increase the numbers of those birds and that we have at least the basis of bringing them back. But if you're a passenger pigeon and you might be nesting in northwestern Ohio one year and western Pennsylvania the next year and maybe you're up near Petoskey, Michigan the year after that, they're nomadic and all over the place, you basically had no strategy for dealing with a bird whose habitat was the forests of eastern North America. And, and, and perhaps uniquely so, be a real challenge to preserve a bird like this in this day. And of course, famously, the last of her kind, Martha, drops dead at one o'clock on September 14th in 1914 at the Cincinnati Zoo. And we actually know the date and the time of the extinction of the species. And this little marker commemorates that at the Cincinnati Zoo. Now, you wanna see a passenger pigeon? You go to a museum. And just for comparison, these are passenger pigeons. These are morning doves. So you see the difference in size. Likewise, these are pileated woodpeckers, and that is an ivory bill woodpecker right there also a bird that's presumably extinct. So, working in a museum of natural history, pay attention to the past. You know, what do we learn from uh, the passenger pigeon's extinction? Clearly, the forces of market hunting, you can't just extract resources and expect them to be there forever. And that was the popular view in the 1800s. You know, nature was unlimited. It would just keep going and on and on and on and there'd always be more. As a matter of fact, there was a committee charged by the Ohio State Legislature in 1857 to give a report on, do the passenger pigeons need any protection? And they said, no, they're wonderfully prolific. They've got the great forests of Canada in which to nest. They'll be here today and tomorrow, and nothing that we do would diminish their numbers. They were functionally extinct in the wilds about 30 years later. One of the last free-flying birds, by the way, was shot down in Sargent's, Ohio, by Press Clay Southworth. He took it and showed it to his mom. His mom said, oh, man, that's one of those blue meteors. You ought to take it down to Sheriff Barnes. His wife is a taxidermist. And so that specimen was, was stuffed by Mrs. Barnes. She didn't have the proper taxidermed glass size, so she used glass buttons. And buttons happens to be in the possession of the Ohio History Center. 
And I haven't been there recently to know if buttons are still on display.